so much, Joshua. Um, can you all see this purple slide here? Yes. Awesome. All right, so uh, today we're gonna be discussing uh, shifting power and wealth to communities and people. Um, I know it's not a high technical sort of term here. I'm gonna turn my camera on as well so you can see me. Uh, great. Um, but I think, you know, we're going to start with the sort of big picture, maybe more, more social oriented issues here around power in our society, especially healthcare society, who has that, who has the dollars, the wealth, and it's not always monetary, it's, it's wealth in terms of ability to generate value, provide value, um, own some level of value as well, um, and have a voice to, to make change. Um, so right now it doesn't necessarily belong to the communities and, and people who live there. Um, yet these are the people we are looking to serve from our healthcare system. So really appreciate uh, the time today to talk uh, through some of the complexities of this vision and how blockchain um, might be able to help here. Um, so we're calling it the first smart community managed service organization, um, sort of in homage to both the smart side of things from a technical standpoint and the blockchain standpoint. And then, you know, an MSO managed service organization is typically uh, the health payers in a way and, and some primary care groups who manage the health care of individuals and patients. Um, and so by way of intro, uh, why I'm so healthcare focused and biased here, I'm actually a primary care physician myself. Um, primarily try to work with underserved populations. Most recently been out in rural Minnesota at the uh, Indian Health Services, uh, the Ogama, uh, the Ojibwe Reservation, the White Earth Nation there, um, serving the people there. Uh, same in Louisville, Kentucky, that was with a special needs population last summer. So really trying to get out to communities and understand their needs, um, their power, lack of power, um, and, and how we might be able to better serve them. I'm also a serial health tech entrepreneur. Um, did a digital health platform, built a digital health platform back in 2015 called Sherbet Health. Um, sold that to a company called Huma out in the UK. It was a remote patient monitoring platform. So kind of had that whole life cycle of the innovation startup world. Um, and, and now sort of post pandemic and, and as, a, as an attending physician and an entrepreneur in the wild, uh, community wealth and health builder, um, hence this presentation. And I'll let my partner here, Michael Levy, introduce himself as well. Yeah, appreciate it, Samir. And, and thanks for uh, you know, um, inviting us. And, and it's great to, to join you all uh, today. Uh, um, you know, no, nothing like health and, and the problems at health uh, that we have in our health system to, to drive collaboration. And I look at Samir and, and Ford uh, Slash as just a, another representation of us uh, at the Digital Health Institute for Transformation, building out uh, the representative uh, partners that, that are uh, you know, arm and, arm and band uh, uh, trying to define the future. But I, I come from 15 years of clinical administration across major academic medical centers from University of Miami to North Carolina, Chapel Hill, UCLA, um, intimately understanding the, the operating nuances of our current healthcare system and, and the shortfalls uh, that, that it is, uh, um, you know, uh, currently um, uh, facing. And, and since about 2014, um, really been working as a digital health evangelist, um, uh, showcasing the, the opportunities, trends, and forces that are 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 really uh, setting up for an inevitability of, of transformation in our in our society, uh, and all that transformation you know orients to to our community and our, our individual uh, members within the community. Hence, uh, my focus and, and and Samir's focus now blending together around community health wealth. Uh, uh, architecture and, and building, and, and that's where this vision and 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 our our presentation today really collide and and allow our, our strengths and competencies to come together through a unified uh, vision. Thanks, Michael. And I forgot to mention I, I am a founder of, of Forward Slash, a sort of brand to bring a lot of this uh, vision together. Um, and uh, just to reiterate some of what Michael just said, it is it is sort of this coming together of visions to create this sort of futuristic. Um, version of what our, our world potentially could be uh, with some sort of blockchain um, powering technology. And with that, let's dive into some of the problems that we're trying to solve here. Um, so if you look at healthcare spend, this is you know old data from 2018. It's only grown, I think, over four, four trillion at this point, or four thousand billion. Um, but back in 2018, you know, where did this this dollar value go towards? Who? Um, you know, hospital care took up 30% of it, physician services 15, the majority of it, you know, there's pharma, there's um, 
other bodies as well that, 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 that got some level of value from this sort of healthcare pot. Um, however, again, people are patients, they live um, in communities where they're born, <laughs> where they work, play, worship, and age. That, that line is really borrowed from the, the social determinants of health world. Um, yet communities are not in this pie chart. People, individuals are not in this pie chart. Um, and that's what we're looking to change here um, to shift this a little bit. <clears throat> if we look at chronic disease prevalences in the US, it's, it's growing. Um, so our current paradigm of, of where that value is going towards, um, they're not delivering uh, on sort of the, the, their share uh, of that value that they're deriving from it. So chronic diseases are increasing. Our, our disparity is especially, especially shown to us from COVID um, over the past few years. We're seeing people of color um, and BIPOC uh, populations really becoming more affected um, especially with COVID, but with all sort of chronic diseases over the past you know, decades. This isn't new. It's just more uh, aware. We're more aware of it now with, with the COVID pandemic. Um, and so we have a, this increasing prevalence of disease and an undeniable impact of racial disparities. Um, how do we start to shift this? Why is our current systems not addressing these issues? Um, this is a, a food map of a place that might look familiar uh, called Washington, D.C. Um, it is sort of the best of what we have when it relates to some of the social needs, the social drivers um, that are, are leading to some of our health indicators. Um, so things like food access, transportation access, housing, housing insecurity. Um, and I don't mean always homelessness. Uh, and I don't always mean, you know, starvation per se. Um, so for um, a housing standpoint, it's um, can you make your rent? Are you short on mortgage payments? Or do you even have a mortgage? Can you even apply for one? Um, or are you living under a bridge in a tent? Um, so it's really the spectrum or out of an extended stay hotel and moving your family with your young kids, you know, month by month, this exists in every city in our country. Um, yet this is the level of precision we can get down to, um, the population level. Um, there's no individual uh, metrics that say, Hey, person X has X, Y, and Z needs. We can't get there just yet. And we need better precision and better data on the individual level. So we can make more personalized interventions. Um, in the medical world, it's almost looking at diabetes prevalence, let's say, across uh, a city and looking at these heat spots of, of where diabetes prevalence is high. And then on the one-on-one -on -one level, when I see this patient, I can't treat them based on the population prevalence of diabetes, but that's what we're kind of doing right now um, with some of these social concerns that are driving health and health outcomes. Um, and I, I guess don't, don't have the stat here, but but the social determinants of health really drive upwards of 60 to 80 percent of what health actually comes from, whereas clinical medicine drives the minority about 20 percent of a person's health and health life. So big statement here, problem statement, these problems are hyper local, but our local communities are underprepared and under resourced and under included, frankly, to solve them. So how do we shift power and wealth? So the good news is and, and and you know the, the I guess a place in time I, I'd, I'd orient us if if uh, if you can take a trip with me uh, back to 1922 of the 21st century um, because we're sitting here in in the moment of time when uh, you know seismic shifts are about to occur uh, given new 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 realities and opportunities no different than the automobile uh, industry and the the transformation of transportation. Uh, in the in the the 1920s, where most of the world at that time was were trying to make horse and buggies faster, um, the the some of us, perhaps many included in this in this call, uh, understand that the capabilities and the technologies and the and the the demands of the future, which are now reorient that system and, and transform that system. Uh, the pandemic highlighted that the need uh, for digital, uh, uh, you know, across every delivery system of, of our of our society, specifically health health care, uh, as Samir alluded to, it only further reinforced the importance of social uh, uh, determinants, or otherwise known as drivers of health, those aspects of health that happen in the day in the life of us as individuals, uh, uh, as it relates to our behavior, our environment, our physical and social uh, construct within the communities we live in, uh, and where value is.
Could Michael be on mute? Yeah, Samir. Oh, no. Was I on Somebody mute this whole time? All you got you is had, my animated hands? Yeah, I just you got had put on mute, great, too. Great hand gestures. <laughs> All oh, hand no. gestures. Yeah. Very, well, very evocative. I, I, uh, I'm sorry uh, that uh, my enthusiasm alone couldn't reach your ears, uh, but uh, I, I hope uh, my, my mic is uh, uh, opened and uh, uh, loud now. Um, I was going to, uh, or I was saying, and I'll, I'll just recycle and, and sh shorten it, but we're in 1922 in the 21st century. Uh, the whole world is uh, effectively trying to make horses faster and buggies faster when uh, transformation is undeniably and inevitably uh, uh, coming to us. And much of the, 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 the brain power, I'm sure, on this uh, call, we know what technically uh, is, is uh, able to accomplish. We understand the technical, the emerging technologies and the, and the capabilities that, that perhaps the car in 1921, 2022 had, but the, the organizational structure, the uh, uh, market forces only are, are coming into play now with the advent of the pandemic and the focus of social determinants of health and the role the individual has within the economic prosperity equation of our society. Um, healthcare, life sciences, payer organizations, employers uh, have, have been awakened to the importance of social determinants or otherwise known as, uh, otherwise known as drivers of health, uh, which are the behaviorals, uh, behavioral data, the environmental data, the social narrative that's happening in, in our lives every single day within our homes and our community. Uh, that backed by uh, our our um, uh, kind of advent and emergence of data systems and, and engagement technologies allow us to look at the future very differently. Uh, so that's like in 1922, knowing that we're about to fly to the moon in, in 30 years and trying to explain to somebody right now uh, that the horse and buggy that they have is not going to be relevant. And that's the place and time that we're at right now. And we believe that that shift that's going to take place is going to be pretty transformative and we've got a theory of change uh, and some early stage practice uh, uh, to prove against that. Samir, do you want to, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't advance the slides. Yeah, yeah, no worries. And I just sort of want to reiterate too, uh, from a clinical or healthcare standpoint, um, this, we're already seeing the beginnings of this with a shift towards value-based care as well. Um, and who really can provide value? Is it just the payers and just the providers known as clinicians? Or can the definition of provider be extended to other uh, organizations and groups such as community members? Um, I really want to highlight this, this aspect of, of Medicaid. Um, you know, to qualify for Medicaid, you, you need to qualify for also something like poverty. Um, yet we're covering this, this need for poverty and the social issues with something like health insurance. And so really this is about how do we uh, how do we reinvent that, reframe that, um, and allow others really expand the market of who who can be involved in, in, in solving uh, for the disease of poverty versus, uh, you know, like Medicare, where it's disease of elderly and, and chronic disease. So we come together, um, forward slash and DHIT, to propose um, this vision of a smart community managed service organization. Everything you see in green is effectively our existing healthcare infrastructure and um, uh, supply chain uh, to an extent, albeit not organized and not uh, allocated in, in a manner that services the individual users, uh, uh, i.e. us as individual members, and that, that that's depicted in, in the dark uh, center. Uh, and everything in yellow is is incumbents and, and, and governance that has an effect on the individuals in the center. But the individuals in the center, i.e. us, uh, don't have the data sets, uh, don't have the infrastructure, don't have the uh, uh, learning cycles and the translation uh, to build agency in ourselves and our communities to attack these opportunities and, and drive change over time. Uh, we're proposing a, a infrastructure that includes you know, significant uh, um, uh, technical infrastructure from a data perspective. Uh, a visualization infrastructure to translate data into insights, uh, human resources that help with smoothing the translation from insights to uh, uh, action, and then the, the uh, consortium of stakeholders that uh, fund and, and, and service 
uh, the, the architecture of demand, the blueprint of demand coming from our individuals. This is personalized medicine. This is personalized health. Uh, uh, and this is where we've got to get to as soon as possible. So this is what we're building forward slash and, and be hit. And, and, and ultimately, uh, uh, Samir, if you want to go forward, what this what this uh, allows us to do is really um, uh, I'll let you jump in here, Samir, but but really take a social first care model approach. Thanks. Yeah, so so I think uh, like Michael was getting at is sort of this this twofold uh, organizational effort, architectural effort that has to happen here. And so there's a sort of superficial layer, the physical layer, if you will, of what has to happen with these community organizations um, on the surface here to organize everyone in a way that they're ready and prepared to take on the needs of, of a population with social deficits. Um, you know, as of now, clinical is a center here, but distributing that clinical becomes the spoke, not the hub. Um, and it's sort of this organization of organizations, community-based organizations across housing, agriculture and food, transportation, uh, primary care, like our local FQHCs, and very, very importantly, activation of the individual. Um, and so, so what is the, the, the data sharing and screening between them, the analyzing, uh, analyzing of capabilities between them, the ability to liaise with clinical data um, to very importantly measure health outcomes and justify you know, payment mechanisms from, from Medicare, Medicaid to, to take on the health of these populations um, and it even win sort of these value-based, risk-based contracts as a community versus a singular hospital or a singular payer. So calling this the smart community managed service organization through a multi-sectoral consortium. And very importantly here to, to kind of run this model here, there needs to be a funding mechanism, um, how to raise the dollars uh, to fund these local organizations. Many of them are nonprofits, many of them are under-resourced, understaffed, lacking the, 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 the talent really too, um, to, to build this model and execute um, in something as complex as health and social needs, even more complex as social needs. Um, so thinking about how to raise this capital stack across all the various stakeholders, of a community, we think about our local payers that exist and kind of, as of now, are on the hook for the patients of that community. We think about our anchor institutions and local hospitals who have their community reinvestment dollars, their impact funds, their accountable care organizations. How we loop that into here? Our venture capital, our CDFIs, um, more on the local level again, um, our state, county, local, local funding um, that's available. This could be anything from Medicaid managed care dollars. Medicaid waivers, as we've seen in California and North Carolina, um, innovation funding that might be available in terms of grants. Um, and again, very importantly, bringing it back to the citizens and the communities who should also be able to participate in the raising of a, of a fund here that gives a bit of voice, that gives a bit of decision making power. And as of now, all of this may happen you know, outside of their consent, outside of their um, ability to speak up and make decisions as it relates to their, to their care and their outcomes. Um, and so in the center here, the governance model, so we can build all this physical, we can organize the, the organizations, we can kind of raise the capital stack and, and, and have that you know, provide the ability and the means to execute here. And then I think now we can start talking about the underlying infrastructure that allows for the governance, um, the governance model of this consortium and this, this sort of funding. Yeah, I would say if you can just pull out that slide one more one more time, Samir, and just kind of go back to a couple of data points that you brought up. One is is eighty percent or or plus of of one's health is is driven by uh, uh, you know their their life in their their home and their community, not by the the, the medical care system that we have. And, and if you, you use that uh, you know kind of basis, and then look at the four trillion dollars uh, going to the medical care system that we have, and not to uh, our community at home, there's a good argument uh, to um, uh, incentivize and 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 uh, propagate a theory here across these stakeholders. Say you're using your resources and your and your investment dollars in in the wrong manner. Let's focus on what matters most and and focus on uh, uh, driving health across our community in our homes by not necessarily just access to medical care, but the access to all the drivers of health, i.e. food, uh, uh, green space, um, uh, uh, you know, um, access to primary care, you know, access to, to um, uh, social services uh, and, and other such uh, aspects that, that we feel are, are the green space, so to speak, uh, that we're building towards right now. And naturally, uh, to to drive and Samir, you can go to down to the next slide to drive that type of governance in a in a model that is 
is heavily disparate, democratized, and 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 competitive. Uh, we need a we need a, a a base level infrastructure that can handle um, our our governance structures and and the free movement of of data uh, based off of um, you know uh, uh, individual fine grained consent. And perhaps you've you've been presented to by Equidium Health. They're a partner of ours uh, that act as our data operators. Uh, uh, that that support uh, this, I you know, kind of theory of of health utility grid narrative, where we can uh, distribute uh, individual personal data lockers to every community member and have edge uh, uh, data processing and attribution models tied to to the value of that data and and the movement of that data, powering new economic incentives to drive engagement and experience around what matters most, the drivers of health. That is my behavior, my environment, my social activities, et cetera. And so what we're trying to establish is a reorientation of incentives and motivations uh, such that we anchor to an appreciated uh, value set versus a depreciated value set. And this is the difference between healthcare and health and, and ultimately uh, uh, the, the infrastructure that is going to power the governance and, and the economics and ultimately health and uh, uh, wellness outcomes. Um, I see a couple of, of uh, hands being raised. I, I wonder if we should just pause and, and um, Samir, maybe you can uh, tee up. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lohman, I think I saw your hand first. Don't forget chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. I'm sure there are things in the chat as well. Yes, I'm seeing uh, the, the reorientation of healthcare in the United States more in line with what's happening in our European partners who are also developed countries. Um, but I'm trying to, to understand how it fits in with our meeting regarding blockchain. This is really important stuff, and I'm starting to hear um, talking about using data, which I'm assuming you're talking about blockchain, um, to re-incentivize these different things. I'm trying to get a, a wrap my head around how it all connects. Do you think you could um, clarify that connection? And Sean, I see you're here too. Oh yeah, Sean, how you doing, bud? Yeah, I, I'm done. Yeah, Michael, do you wanna do you wanna talk a little bit to the to the blockchain aspect of this? Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, this is about you know the core use of uh, technologies to drive transformational shift uh, in where value, how value is uh, captured and paid for over time. Our current models of healthcare uh, funding and 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 uh, uh, evaluation of success. Uh, are anchored on on disease and sickness, and and they're they're slowly transitioning to uh, that of of uh, a quality based or value based paradigms. But at the end of the day, um, the big I would say the biggest stick in in the equation is the trust and in, and agency the individual has within their uh, health equation and what uh, level of of, of you know, value they set on engaging. Uh, within the community to improve themselves and their community uh, around them. And we see blockchain uh, as the, you know, effectively the interstate, the gas stations, the mechanic shops, if, it, if you will, lack of better analogies, to, to the transportation uh, 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 transformation, whereas, whereas it's a critical infrastructure that does not exist that powers a, a level of democratization that allows a global supply chain of resources to actually service at the edge in a manner that individualizes and speaks to cultural sensitivities and, and idiosyncrasies of, of the individual in the community. Without a, a normalizing technology backbone like this, uh, uh, we, we will not be able to uh, uh, create a collaborative health landscape. It will maintain its competitive nature, maintain uh, 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 you know, prioritization of, of data and isolation of, of critical data sets. Thus, we won't have information flowing to uh, uh, drive better decision making based off of our continuous learning cycles that our human systems go through as well as our data systems go through. And so what, what we're proposing is, is the 
critical need for uh, uh, this blockchain uh, uh, and uh, Web3 stack to service as a new public utility for our nation, ultimately. To be treated like water, gas, electricity, um, the, the emergence of wearables, IoT, otherwise known as data collection devices is no different than solar panels uh, as it relates to putting them on your house and, and powering your home and then selling the excess value back to the grid. This is fundamentally uh, where we need to get to with health data to power our society. And Marquis Allen, I want to make sure we get your, your question as well. Hey, yeah, Samir, Mike, thanks for this, uh, this presentation. I'll be brief because like Sandy said, there are some uh, questions in the chat. And actually, uh, Sandy mentioned something that I was curious about. Um, th this is really fascinating stuff. Uh, my friend Heather uh, came and spoke at a healthcare roundtable about uh, data as an asset class. Uh, and so that, that fits with what you guys are, are talking about. And I agree that's, that's the way we should, should move. Uh, but th this actually speaks to something Sandy asked. He said, uh, have you been involved in a consortium managing the health data for NIH? And that, to piggyback on that, I was interested in whether or not you have a strategy to pull in some publicly available data sets from some of these agencies like, you know, HUD and CMS and HHS um, in order to have a foundational, uh, I guess, data pool uh, to draw from and even to assign uh, data bits to uh, to participants at the edge, uh, you know, like you, you find my data about how I uh, got the bit food insecure, right? And then you find that I'm a, a, a contributor or a participant on the network uh, to, to get me access or ownership to that data. I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, I think, um, the population level data and these data sets, the USDA has got the food ones, you know, NIH has theirs. Um, there's you know, housing insecurity databases and, and a bunch of organizers, aggregators of these population level data sets. Um, I think that's that's obtainable if needed. Socially Determined has done a great job, specifically speaking of, of kind of organizing that and, and, and productizing it as well. H however, I think, you know, the, what we're struggling with is, again, the individual level connecting them, their health outcomes, their social needs kind of together and making that something that, that we can intervene on on the individual identifiable level. And so healthcare currently kind of addressing that providers with Z codes with prepare screens. Um, however, you know, that, that involves the, the, the healthcare provider taking the time out of his or her day to, to ask the hard questions, you know, from a Z code standpoint, um, to, to give the prepare screening. And that data is just really hard to obtain. And one of the theories on how to improve the acquisition of that data is to engage the individual to provide it. Um, and so to but to give the uh, individual an to, to get the individual to get it, there needs to be an incentivization mechanism. Hence, what we're talking about here is, is how do we create data that's that's open, that's available, that's shared, that's owned, um, but shareable in sort of a transactive way um, that, that does engage the individual, that makes it very specific, very precise, very individualized compared to the population level databases that are you know available and open that you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And, and, and perhaps I might <laughs> add, you know, the the cultural um, maturity uh, that need, critically needs to be focused on at an individual level, at an organizational and a community uh, level uh, as it relates to um, how do you look at data uh, from a historical perspective and leverage it for future development cycles across you know, you as a human being and you as a, a as an organization, this is not normal operating models. And this is where we get a lot of, I would say, implementation and adoption uh, um, uh, barriers to uh, there's a, a S curve of maturity as it relates to digital uh, mastery and, and, and ultimately, uh, uh, you know, developing off of data driven cycles. And, and we we have, as a culture, not been educated, not been practicing, and now thrust into the deep end of digital. And, and the, back to the 90, 95% of the world, we're, we still think we're trying to make horses faster, right? And so there's a, there's a mind shift uh, that has to take place to, to, to yearn this information, 
to to actualize and 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 adopt the information no different than professional pro athletes do on a day-to-day -day basis with their technologies and their coaches helping them to be better every single day from yesterday and this is the continuous learning cycles that drive digital transformation and i would argue and posit that these are the same transformation models that that are operating models that drive human transformation so as much as we can get this technology set and laid it is rendered useless until we have uh, the individual and organizational community cultures, uh, uh, you know, in, engaged and in, and in, in yearning. And, and that's why, you know, our, our, our posit as it relates to, you know, kind of how do you, where do you start? How do you start? You know, what is what does success look like in early stages? This is not a overnight reality. You know, this is an overtime reality, but we can get wins along the way based off of, you know, uh, um, uh, scoping down the, the geographic scope or service line scope to, to try. And I do want to get into those examples and I want to be mindful of time here. Um, but Dr. Ferrer, did you have a, a thought or a comment here? Yeah, can you hear me, Dr. Samir? Yes, I got you. Okay, very good. I have a question, sir. It seems that the Z code conversation is because, you know, historically we would actually glean a lot of those social determinant data from a good interrogation during history and physical exam. And as you know, today the clinical platforms we use don't even have an area we would input that information in the clinical application, at least in the acute care setting, because you have the administrative component where a lot of the data is driven from, and then you have the clinical application where that data is actually not existing. Um, so it would seem that this, are you trying to offset what classically would have, that kind of information that if you look at history and physical exams of a decade, 15 years ago, most of that information and in good interrogation was actually there. Is that is that the kind of information that you're, you're trying to gleam out of this platform? Yeah, I think to, to a degree, it's it's expanding on that data a little bit and expanding on who can collect it. So not just, you know, absolute uh, dependence on, on the, the busy physician, but it is data that's a little bit more nuanced than just the, the normal history and social social history there. It's, you know, like you can ask about domestic violence, ask about access to food, how how far away from you are, uh, how far away are you from a grocery store? Um, you know, you're, are you able to make your rent? Are you struggling? Is there um, you know, getting you into like ACEs and, and childhood adverse childhood event scores, that kind of thing. Um, it's it's a little bit more nuanced and a lot more specific, so that we can connect you to community resources, such as such as food access, uh, medically tailored meals, food as medicine, um, or on the on the, the housing end, uh, group like HUD voucher dollars. I think we as providers, and I, I can't speak to 15, 20 years ago. I wasn't I wasn't there. Um, I was ten maybe. Um, but I you know I that. We, we don't typically have a way to refer into the social safety net as providers today, as far as I've seen. Um, so yes, and and I, would, I would perhaps piggyback with that to say, look, the, the, the trends right now and the forces that are, uh, you know, kind of challenging our current historical um, uh, healthcare system from the staffing shortages, you know, what about 180,000 staff, you know, uh, physician, caregiver staffing shortage by 2030, uh, the sandwich generation carrying, you know, tremendous amount of that burden now, you know, who's who and, and, and with the advent of, of the um, uh, trend transformation from the W2 to the freelance and you know, freelance worker going from, you know, 30 percent freelance to 70 percent freelance by 2030. The, the way we care for ourselves is going to fundamentally shift to where every single one of us are going to be caregivers, care providers. So the, the common societal mem you know, community member has to develop the core competencies and be incentivized and paid for uh, for caregiving. Right now, there's about four hundred plus billion dollar uh, value of uncompensated care going on in this country. It's only going to expand expand and explode. And so this act, this this infrastructure and the economic models and actuarial models that are mathematically possible uh, now that aren't implemented are going to service uh, that future caring economy. And lastly, Sean, if, if you can be brief just so we can, can complete the presentation here. Certainly. And, and forgive me, I came in late. Uh, uh, Dr. Sood, uh, where where are you from and who are you representing? Uh, so I'm I'm from New Jersey, I suppose. I'm kind of uh, a digital nomad these days. Organization, organizationally, sorry. Uh, forward slash, forward slash. 
uh, sort of a new organization uh, kind of working. I'm, it's, it's more of a startup at this point, um, but working sort of in partnership with Michael. Uh, I know he's working with you guys at Quidium as well. Right, and that, that was our slide that you just showed prior. So attribution in the future, please. Um, it, I did. It is. It is attributed to Equidium, Sean. Not on the slide. That's. Uh, oh, I didn't That's see Equidium that. Equidium half. Got it. I didn't see that part on there. But uh, much appreciated. Would love to be coordinated with prior to this in the future because there's definitely some specific uh, details um, we have shared with this group that may not align with your messaging on it. Um, just bringing that up publicly because uh, this kind of took me by surprise. But let's, uh, Michael, uh, Samir, let's coordinate a meeting. Um, Maybe maybe today, but maybe uh, later on, so we can all get on the same page. That said, um, are you? It, it says VA blockchain presentation. Is that from uh, Josh's Hakakians, or is this something related to VA? This uh, is just this our consolidation for this meeting, uh, Sean. Gotcha. And, no, no. And I'm this, not, this by no means does this uh, uh, supersede, or I mean, this is in in conjunction and, and aligned too. So happy to just, um, just, again. Josh, I just I, I'm I'm playing catch up here. I apologize for being late. That's the that's that's my own cost there. Um, that that said, I do I, I am curious about um, where you see you're 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 from a physician's background, correct? Yeah. Excellent. Where do you see the physician's role in this, as opposed to oftentimes the patient and the enterprise role that are. And I, I find the main focus. I see the physician getting oftentimes left out when when we speak of and Equidium speaks of this of patients owning their own data. To some extent, there's intellectual property components that a physician contributes to heavily. Do do you envision in any type of future uh, marketplace for data that not only can the patient have some component ownership, but the physician has some as well? Is that something that you've explored or looked at? Because I, I think that's a, a very um, critical component that hasn't been talked about a lot. Over. Yeah, I think that's a, a great thought. I think they are one of the stakeholders next to patients, next to community organizations, next to hospitals, payers, whoever. I think typically or historically they're thought of as the quarterback and the center uh, of the, the provider, the obtainer, um, the disseminator of whatever data and information, the owner of that data information, at least the hospital system that they work in. But I, I, I do appreciate you know them being an important part of this, but also equal to and next to the social worker, equal to and next to the patient. As, as a provider of this data. So um, uh, I, I think it's, and, and unfortunately, a lot of physicians are unaware of, of a lot of this technology that's that's either growing or that's capable right now. And so including them at some point in this in this process is very important, um, but I can't say that we're co-designing and building you know, with, the, with the provider physician at this moment. Um, all right, I'm, I'm gonna continue. Roger, I apologize. Maybe if we have time at the yep. end, we can- If I can say- there are some physician DAOs out there that may tie in very nicely. We can follow up offline, but uh, definitely I want to coordinate with you and Michael in, the, in, in sometime next week was probably good. Thank you. Perfect. Love it. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. Um, all right. So uh, Joshua, keep me honest on time here. I know we're, we're, we're very close to the, the 10 50 PM uh, AM deadline, um, we, but you can, you real, can run it. You, you can run it down if you need to. Okay, okay, great. Um, so just gonna go through a couple of these pieces. Again, this is a really, really big, big picture vision that Michael and I kind of presented today. It's not that that vision is not in practice today, but really we're trying to break it down into these small parts um, that kind of lead up to you know building the proof points to put this all together at some point uh, and hopefully the next few years. But um, so really want to go over this first um, consortium, community, you know, multi-sectoral multi consortium that I referred to before. This is one that forward slash uh, in conjunction with Healthy Black Families and the city of Berkeley is kind of putting together um, with the local uh, health anchors, talking to, uh, yeah, to, with local health anchors at this time. Um, we're really trying to, to align the stakeholders, the local food group, the local housing group, the local, you know, transportation there at the, at the BART station. Um, and the city of Berkeley and the local hospital um, to kind of create that consortium that is capable of fundraising, capable of, of governing and deciding what community development resources need to happen in this, this community, um, sort of by the Ashby BART station, if any of you are familiar with Berkeley as a neighborhood. Um, so, so this is the beginning stages of what we view as, you know, something that could be um, the physical infrastructure getting in place, but could be run on sort of that blockchain architecture um, as we continue to build this out. 
Um, secondly, talking to a lot of community-based organizations, Nevada Housing Coalition, the people concerned that is really, uh, they're in uh, LA, Southern California, uh, they do a lot of housing, uh, homelessness work with a lot of wraparound care services. However, they are really not part of the, the provider or care, healthcare ecosystem just yet, but absolutely could and should be. Um, and then in that Berkeley area, we're talking to the Alameda Health Consortium and the Berkeley Food Network. And again, how to empower and enable these organizations to start really taking on the health of collecting data for um, and being um, valued either monetarily or at least from a voice and decision-making standpoint um, in the healthcare uh, ecosystem out there. Lastly, I'll go over the, the healthcare finance community development. So the funding sources, you know, when we talk about community development, this is in Chinatown uh, around 800 Vine Street, Philadelphia, um, in conjunction with the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation and Creative Development Partners, two real estate developers. Um, they are looking to fundraise for a, a large 475,000 square foot uh, build opportunity here. Um, typically, funding for these types of, of, of builds comes from construction debt, uh, private investment, private equity, um, and, and really uh, uh, bonds, uh, none of which really comes with this mandate to improve health and health outcomes, to, to engage the individual, engage the patient, um, collect and measure you know, data and health outcomes. And so what we're trying to do here is raise that sort of comprehensive capital stack that could include local hospitals in the Philadelphia area, local payers, and very importantly, um, the individual is actually benefiting um, from something like this so we can push development to not just high-end luxury spaces per se, but really a community health worker office, a co-op grocery store, a child care center, things that benefit the community, those who live in that building or on this property, and those in the surrounding community. So they have a funding gap of $50 million, and we're trying to close this with those creative financing mechanisms. And importantly, at some point, we'll need a sort of governance um, aspect that, that helps uh, everyone who kind of invested be a decision maker in how these dollars are spent. I guess I just added, you know, as this comes together and we build that density, uh, you know, in, in community, it, it, it then brings up, you know, the opportunity to have these conversations around what the data is saying. These are a uh, pretty bad resolution, but these are our early uh, applications off of our, our uh, um, you know, kind of consolidated uh, cross uh, community data set, looking at economics, looking at environment, looking at behavior, looking at capacity, care and healthcare index. Um, and overlaying this specifically in, in North Carolina, overlaying it against COVID uh, um, uh, uh, proliferation. This was uh, really an, it, it kind of accelerated the development during uh, pandemic. We went out into a uh, field uh, educating our you know, community members at a, a community level um, against you know what 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 the economic equation looked like, what the health equation looked like, and what did our behaviors look like as it related to the activities across our community. And then we brought that down to the individual le level and, and, and began representing as a digital twin uh, what uh, diabetes and COVID would look like together and representing that. And then uh, uh, launching the Health Architect Program, which is a human resource program that helps with that translation in the beginning to those really, really, really deep uh, personal conversations that need to be had, like Tamir was saying, to get to the data sets that have the most value, uh, which is what is happening in the day in the life of me uh, and or my family that is creating uh, the downstream uh, uh, problems in our in our current system. <clears throat> All right, so uh, just sort of wrapping up here, um, the key takeaways here. The need for local, preventative, precise social data and clinical care, or to drive clinical care and clinical outcomes. Um, the rate of progress here is, as, as we kind of view it, the technology is in hand. You know, it's being developed from so many different technological sectors. Um, but one of the biggest, hardest non-technical components here is that distribution of power. Um, and that's a culture shift. That's a, a bit of a sacrifice from those kind of high up in power that have the dollar capture right now. How do we let them? Um, permission and, and give uh, the ability to these local communities, local individuals to participate um, in, in some of these health activities. Um, things like housing, food, transportation are the biggest drivers to health here, yet those rely not in our hospitals and payers um, and our governmental bodies per se, but in these local communities that have organizations that can um, provide those resources. Um, and so we're just looking to kind of take advantage of the, the, some of the major shifts that we're, we're starting to see 
um, and push them a little bit further um, in our in our in, in our power shifting thinking and our uh, way we change value to align incentives and motivations for community and individual enablement. Um, and lastly, I think a big driving force uh, of what this work is, is that prevention happens when people, individuals have agency to respond to and access to resources for their critical needs and are not completely dependent on a, on a system to provide that for them. And I'll, I'll just leave this, this slide up here. I only have about four minutes left. Um, so we can, we're happy to take additional questions or Joshua, if you need us to jump off, um, happy to do that as well. Hey, how about uh, if you gentlemen, first of all, thanks for, for coming in and, and uh, taking this opportunity to speak with the group today. We appreciate it. And, uh, it, you know, you have a very, um, it's a good way, uh, I think an integral sort of um, a pathway to move forward and one that I think speaks to a lot of people. I would like to give uh, Dr. Boodoo an opportunity to uh, ask his question of you, if you don't mind. Please. Dr. Boodoo, are you still on the call? OK, well, does anyone else have any questions? Um, for the gentleman presenting today. Uh, Mike and Samir, again, thanks for this. Uh, this presentation it was very insightful. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys offline about this. This is Marquis. Thank Pleasure, you. Marquis. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Um, and, and of course, if, if there's any interest in to, to connect uh, further, please. Uh, I'm at Michael at BHITGlobal.org. We'll follow up uh, naturally, Samir.